who uses principles of psychology, true psychology, so that you can realize that there is no healing within you, there is nothing you can do to help yourself, the opposite of psychology. Psychology tries to make you look inside in order to heal yourself. It is the opposite. The Bible says, look up, don't look inside. Look above, don't look in it within. Because there is only one who has help for you. Because if you look inside, by yourself, and you discover this, and you don't turn to Jesus, it will crush you to the point that it can kill you. True. And though Jesus wants to kill you, that is not the way he wants to kill you in the, in the real sense. There are people who are so crushed, so burdened by their sense of guilt, by their sense of inability, by their horrible view of self, and they don't know where to go, that they end up hanging themselves from a tree or, or, or shooting themselves or throwing themselves in front of a train. That is not what God, Jesus wants. Jesus wants to show you how you are with the only purpose that you will turn to him in a hurry. <laughs> Amen? And so Jesus says, you are wretched. What does it mean to be wretched? That word appears only twice in the scriptures. Only twice. In the, uh, the strong, strongs defines that word as being enduring toils and troubles, afflicted. But we find that word in Romans chapter 7 and verses 22 through to 24. And it is associated with a very interesting experience of Paul. Verses 22 through to 24. The only other part of the scriptures where the word wretched is found and it enlightens the meaning of Romans chapter 3 verse 17. It says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man of, that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The word wretched means In the context that Paul tells us, you are wretched when you are controlled by the old self. Wretchedness comes as a result to a Christian who has seen the law, he wants to keep the law, he wants to be obedient, because this is what he has been taught, as Paul describes in chapter 7, he, he, he saw the law, he became dead by the law, and then he grows to an experience of trying to keep that law. And he finds that every time he makes a decision to keep the law, to be obedient, to be pure, what happens with him? He ends up flat on his face, and he finds that there is another power that is controlling him, and it is the old self, the man of sin that has him by the neck and is not letting him go. And at the end, Paul, at the end of this battle, Paul says, O oh, wretched man of me, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will take this body that I may no longer be wretched? And Laodicea is wretched because Laodicea has exactly the same conflict. You see, Adventists, we know the Ten Commandments. We have been led to believe that the Ten Commandments we must keep. And it's true. But because we are controlled by self, self says, I will keep the law. And for so many years, Adventists have been trying to keep the law. To find out that the law is a heavy yoke. That it never lets you go. You have never got peace. You can never go to a bed in peace knowing that this day you have completed the day doing the will of God perfectly and fully. True? You always carry behind your mind the, 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 the thought that you have broken the law and that you are condemned. You have all that Adventists that are afraid to die. Why? Because they do not know whether they are perfect. And let us see is tortured by the law. O oh, wretched man of me. And Jesus says, let me tell you, you are wretched. What does that mean? You have all your life of Advent has been trying to give the law, but you have never been able to do it. And you have a tortured, tortured conscience because you have not accomplished it. True Adventists? Amen. I've grown as one. 
wretched. Second description of, uh, that Jesus gives us of ourselves, of that which we do not know we are, is the word miserable. Man, if I call someone, you wretched, miserable, I, they will never be my friends again. Thanks, thanks the Lord, it's Jesus who's calling me this. Miserable. What does that, that word miserable mean? Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 16 through to 19. Chapter 16, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verses 16 through to 19. Again, miserable is not a word that appears many times in the Bible. The word misery appears a number of times. But this word miserable is repeated here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it, it, again, it enlightens us. It enlightens the meaning of Revelation 3 in a, in a beautiful way. Notice what it says, verses 16 through to 19. It says, Yes, and we have found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. That word most pitiable in the original is the exact word of Revelation 3.17, miserable. What does the word miserable describe in Revelation 3.17? It's a Christianity lived as if Christ has never been risen. A Christianity that proclaims that Christ is arise, but that is lived as if he's still dead. Pastor Braga, how do we do that? And Paul tells us in verse, seven, in verse uh, 17 that if Jesus was not raised from the dead, our faith would be futile. And for many Adventists, when you talked about living by faith, oh, oh, it's as if you have talked to them about the devil. Oh, I believe in God, they say. I believe in God. But do you believe that Jesus is coming? Oh, yeah, maybe. Hopefully in the next ten years. Do you believe that Jesus is able to give you victory over sin? Oh, yeah, when he comes, maybe. We have a faith that is futile, friends. The faith that we say to have in Jesus is actually futile because it's good for nothing. We have an, a Christian experience that is manifested as if Jesus was never raised from the dead. Because if Jesus was raised from the dead, Christians have to their access all power. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then we should die to self and let the Holy Spirit live. If Jesus was raised from the dead, dear friends, we of all people should be the most living ones. Then miserable is a Christianity that is hopeless. A Christianity whose faith is vain and that sin still controls their life and have not found true pardon. That's miserable. What about poor? What does the word poor mean? Psalm chapter 70 verse 5 says that poor are those who are needy and have no one to help them. Psalm chapter 74 verse 2 says that uh, poor is one who's needy and oppressed. And Matthew chapter 5 verse 3 speaks of spiritually poor. And when Jesus says to Laodicea, you, I, let me tell you, you are poor, Jesus is not speaking the physically poor. He, Jesus here is speaking about the spiritually poor. What does it mean to be a spiritually poor? It means that you are needy and you have no one to help you. It means that you are needy and that you are oppressed. 